Hello everyone, happy Friday, and thank you for joining me again for another episode of Frequently Asked Questions about honeybees and beginning with bees. This is Frequently Asked Questions episode number seven, and uh, as you saw maybe in the beginning of the video, again, the weather is all over the place, and day before yesterday it was freezing, yesterday it was down in the teens, 11 degrees out in the woodshop for example, and today, as you saw, it started out at minus six, minus seven. But the good news was there was not a lot of wind. So even though we're freezing, it uh, the wind would be a compounded problem. But guess what? Now the sun is actually shining again. And uh, that's nice. But guess what's going to happen? Another super wind storm. So we're going to get wind gusts uh, starting tomorrow, Saturday at uh, 50 miles an hour and the good news is my hives are still strapped down from the last time and the compounded good news is that uh, they handled 57 to 58 mile an hour wind gusts last week during the freezing cold and the bees are still alive of course that's just the way it goes uh, we're going to have warm temperatures on sunday it's going to hit the 50s which would be great you could get out there and check on your bees right no, because we're going to get, aside from the winds, it's going to be a constant downpour. So there's that. The weather goes up, the winds go up, the weather turns bad. By the way, these uh, frequently asked questions series, uh, these bee questions are relevant to beginners with bees. And uh, those are just basically curious. If you're a longtime beekeeper, um, then this will probably bore you and you probably already have the answers. Feel free to stick around if you like to. We're happy to talk about that. These are going to be questions that were submitted by viewers either through Facebook or in the comment section of the past videos. So if you have questions that I haven't covered already, also I'm going to list down in the video description the questions that we're addressing today, and there'll be some valuable links for you too. If you want to do some further research on some of the subjects we're going to cover, those will be down there as well. So thanks again, and uh, please write your questions. I'll be glad to address them if it seems like they're broad enough base that others might be interested in the next one. The other thing is, some of you may be expecting my video on <clears throat> beginning with flow hives and uh, how to set them up for the cold climates. And so, as I've mentioned before, we had terrible weather this week and my plan was to make some really cool modifications and things that I want to introduce with that. And uh, I just got tired of working out there in 9 and 10 degree weather, so my shop's not heated. Uh, so that will be coming around tomorrow or Sunday, so check back in with me if you want to see that, if you're interested in the flow hive and how I get them through winter. Now some of the information that I put out there is going to be relevant to everybody, so not just flow hive enthusiasts. So please join me for that. And uh, we'll jump right in. The very first question I have comes from Spirit Bear 12 Thank you, by the way, I see your name a lot on my videos, frequent commenters. I'm always glad to see this kind of continuing community of beekeepers. And uh, I really appreciate that you take the time to watch and submit questions. But uh, his first question, two parts here. Uh, honey crystallized in hives and jars. Okay, crystallization of the honey is uh, solidification of the honey. So it's still, con technically it's a liquid but it has a solid state by all practical purposes. So the thing is, uh, when that's in the hive, that's not something that uh, is alien to the bees. When, uh, for example, aster, uh, goldenrod, which happens late in the season here, that has a, a tendency to solidify quickly in the cells. So you want to extract your honey right away if you're going to do that. So that just means you delay it and it may actually solidify in the jar. So then what happens? So first let's talk about uh, solidified honey in the comb. The bees can still use it. They're just going to reliquify it. Uh, solidified honey lasts forever, basically. There's nothing wrong with it. It's 100% usable. And uh, the bees will happily use it. Now here's the other thing. Inside the beehive in wintertime, uh, people think that solidified, whether it's sugar crystals or fondant or things like that, the bees might have a hard time metabolizing that because uh, it's dry. But the thing is, there's condensation on the surface of your frames in the wintertime. The only heat is in the bee cluster itself. The bees don't heat the space like your house where you turn on central heat and if you have a huge house you have to generate a lot of heat to warm it. The bees aren't like that. The bees generate heat in the cluster alone. 
the outermost bees are the insulators and they're taking the brunt of it because they're exposed to that cold edge and then they gradually migrate into the cluster and they keep rotating and changing and that cluster if you could watch it in slow motion would gradually move across a frame of honeycomb and they would continue to consume those resources to stay warm and continue their state of torpor in winter so beyond that though and i have another video in fact i may show that up here while i'm talking about it uh, there's condensation outside of that heating area and it forms on the surfaces of the hive and on the honeycomb and then the bees actually will go out when they can or the bees that are on that outer fringe will be using their tongues to lick up that condensation and that's valuable moisture for the bees that they use to liquefy honey that's solidified to uh, metabolize solid foods so if you've got sugar crystals and things like that and the bees can actually break that cluster a little bit on those warm winter days, like today, the sun's hitting, even though we started out sub-zero. Now we're jumping up into the 30s and sunny. So I know that inside the hive, if the hives are not insulated, those bees are getting warmed up early and they're going to be moving around inside the hive and taking advantage of that extra resource inside the hive. And they'll be using condensation as a source for drinking. So it's a bonus. So the short story is it's still good. And if it's crystallized in a jar, that's still good too and you can just scoop that out and spread that on your toast and stuff and it'll re-liquefy when it hits hot surfaces. What if you want to re-liquefy it in the jar? Well you take the jar and you can set it in hot water. How hot does it have to be? How hot's too hot? You don't want to take raw honey which is outstanding honey and ruin it by heating it up. Don't put that stuff in the microwave. Do not uh, and again these are when I say do not, you know, it sounds kind of bossy, but uh, I don't recommend that you put it in the microwave because you're going to ruin some of those fantastic properties of the honey. Also, when you put it in a um, container of water, if here's a, oh, if you have a jar of honey, fill the container of water right up to the shoulder of the honey, loosen the cap just a little bit, okay, because it might expand and you don't want to create too much pressure. And again, it's going to create a vacuum when it cools down. Take it up to about 125 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go much higher than that, you can alter the properties of the honey and you can ruin it. So don't hit 150, 149. And there's a lot of science behind what happens to sugars. Honey is a sugar. And uh, we just want to keep it liquid. And uh, that's if you want to be able to pour it. But if you're fine with it solidified, it's just as good. Continue to use that. You can put it in your tea, you can put it in your coffee, you can put it on toast, as I've mentioned before and it will remelt and it's spreadable. So there's no harm in the jar or in the honeycomb in the hive. Crystallized honey, solidified honey is nutritionally the same. So it's just a matter of whether you want it to be liquid or not and the bees will still use it. If you have it in a flow hive, it's not gonna come out of the flow frames. Let the bees clean that up first and then let them add more honey to that in the coming season. Now, if it's stuck in there and you have to pull those flow frames, you can let the bees clean it up outside of the hive. And uh, that's a good way too. But there's nothing wrong with it. Second part of Spirit Bear's question here is, if not selling honey, do I have to be inspected? Honey bee apiary inspections and the honey itself are two separate things. So if you're selling your own honey, let's say you have a vegetable garden and you're growing vegetables, tomatoes, and corn, and all the stuff you see at roadside uh, sales. Little People put up little huts and lean-tos, or sometimes they just pack up their pickup truck and put a sign out, and they'll sell their produce. Uh, does that have to be inspected? No, it doesn't. And I'm talking specifically to my state, and my state is the state of Pennsylvania. So, And we're in the United States. So the same thing is true with eggs from free-range chickens. And it's true if you're selling honey that you extract yourself from your own apiary. You do not have to register that with the Department of Agriculture as a honey commodity. Because you're going directly from producer to consumer. There's nothing in between. You probably should put a label on it and tell people what it is. It's raw honey. Maybe you know the source. Maybe it's clover honey. Maybe it's um, basswood honey or something like that, and you know that that's predominantly what's in there. It's helpful to label that, and you also should label how much it is. Is there a pound? Is there, a, you know, is it by quart? Is it by weight? And uh, and then put your name on it. 
because you never know they're going to tell other people where they got that honey and they want to get it from you how much should you sell it for twenty dollars a quart and uh, so does it have to be a spec and now you turn it into a business let's say you have an abundance of honey and now you want to take it to the whole foods co-op and you want to have somebody sell on your behalf now you have to register with the department of agriculture and i'll i'll put a link up there for my state if you have uh, specific requirements that differ in your state, it is a food, but it's uh, produced and marketed from the producer type of sale, which is a totally different set of regulations. So you have to register your apiary though. So if you have even one hive of bees in your yard in my state, you still have to document that uh, you have that. You have to register it with the Department of Agriculture and you're gonna get an apiary registration number and it's going to cost $10 a year. And I see that $10 a year is helping support that system. We want inspectors. We want an apiary oversight group. And uh, the more people that register, then that also means that uh, the more people are contributing information statewide so we can see what's going on in different regions and zones. Plus, if you ever have a problem, you need to call the Department of Agriculture. You're already registered. You're on the grid. And you can let them know. And an inspector will come out. What's the likelihood that an inspector is going to come out and look at you once you're registered? Very slim. I've been inspected three times in the entire time I've been keeping bees, and this is my 12th year of beekeeping. So that's uh, you need to register. That's just helpful to the Department of Agriculture's apiary portion, and uh, it's the law. So there you go. Does that mean if you don't register, they're going to come and issue a big citation? Unlikely, unless somebody that doesn't like you turns you in. So that answers Spirit Bear's questions. The next one, Carlos Murphy, another frequent commenter on my videos. It's good to see your question. And uh, when do I stop feeding syrup and water availability in the hive? He wants to know if putting water inside your beehive, since we do sugar syrups and things like that for bees that need those resources, would it also be an advantage to go ahead and put water inside the hive? Now these are my personal preferences based on my own experience with bees. So I'm going to say I would not put a water source inside my beehive. The bees regulate the humidity inside the beehive extremely well. They have access to water outside. The other thing is you might say, well, we have the condensation in winter that the bees can use when the bees can move around and access it. You don't want condensation dripping straight down on the bees and dampening them. That's a totally different thing. But uh, frosty walls, for example, inside that hive are a benefit to the bees because they use the moisture because they can't fly out in the snow and get those resources. So you don't want to put a, a water resource inside your hive, particularly in winter, because it's just going to freeze. Because remember that the space inside your beehive, the entire space, is not heated. The only heated area is the cluster itself. So if you had up on an inner cover or some kind of feeding shim, if you had a water resource up there, it's going to freeze like anything else and that uh, is going to turn into a block of ice and it may even split or damage the container that it's in and then when we get that next thaw it may leak right down inside the hive so i would say do not put water inside your beehive so uh, when do i stop feeding sugar syrup so here's the thing it's based on the weather conditions in your area and the general climate in your area uh, first of all, why are you feeding the sugar syrup? If it's a hive that needs those resources because maybe it's a late season swarm or maybe you've had just terrible weather for an extended period of time, you know they need those resources and they can't get out and get nectar because the bees can't get nectar in a rainstorm if it continues to rain and be damp and cold, then you may be feeding. So the, the cutoff is when you start to get those consistent cold days. It's common to drop down into the 30s near freezing at night late in the year and that's when you start to think about first of all changing the percentage first of all uh, during the warm weather periods it's one to one by weight pound of sugar pound of water mix it together sugar syrup now what if you're off a little bit does that really matter No, the bees don't seem to care but you're providing a carbohydrate you're providing an energy source to the bees that's going to keep their brood warm and the brood is what we're kind of focused on healthy brood healthy hive so um, when do you stop doing that? Later in the season, two to one. So we get even more dense with the sugar to water ratio. Two pounds of sugar, one pound of water, for example. And that has to be heated in order for that to even liquefy. 
and then the bees will use that. But now when we get into those freezing days, that means the bees can't fly out. So I just put you in traffic in a major city and you just ate three bran muffins and drank a quart of coffee and you can't get out of your car to go to the bathroom because traffic's all backed up. Is that a good analogy? I don't know. But uh, the bees are stuck inside. They can't go to the bathroom. So we want to cut down on their liquids because if they have a high liquid diet at that time, honey is a very high viscosity, low liquid diet and primarily converted into energy. So if we have a high liquid diet, the bees need to have access to the outside to eliminate. If they can't do that, there's a very good chance they're going to get sick inside the hive. They're going to eliminate inside the hive because they just can't hold it anymore. You'll see bees that have held it for so long that the minute they can get out of the hive, they're squirting. As soon as they fly out of that entrance hole, they just squirt and eliminate right into the air. And that's because they're doing their best to hold that liquid. So we want to cut down on the amount of liquid that we're providing with them for them as they go into winter. So that's also the time that you stop providing heavy syrups and you convert to dry. Okay. So some people put in fondant after that. So once the freezing areas start, same thing in the spring, I would not be today is, uh, I don't even know the date, but any, anyway, we're in March now. So it's already, uh, we, so as you can see, I have freezing days. We have snow everywhere. I would not be putting any kind of liquid diet inside the hive. So I'd be putting dry feed in there. So even dry sugar is okay. Uh, pure cane sugar, just put it in on the top board or something like that and they'll get to that. And, uh, but I would not yet be putting liquid in. The other thing is uh, once they start brood and they have this time of year, all the good queens have started brood and they have a huge demand on the resources in that, inside the hive and they're depending on stored pollen. So the minute that I get a chance when it's not windy and rainy and the temperatures come up and cooperate with me, I need to be able to look into my brood frames to see how much pollen they have stored and we might even have to supplement that. This is the time of year when people are putting on pollen patties and uh, they're going to start to heavily supplement uh, their bees to make sure they have a strong send off in spring. So right now we're in that terrible zone and people that are already talking about bees that have made it and bees that have died, you could be completely wrong on both parts. Don't be tempted to pull open a beehive and look in on your bees while you still have freezing weather and the potential for freezing weather in your area. Unless it hits the 60s or something and everybody's flying great, then you're safe to open it. But if everything is still in a state of torpor and you're still looking at your hives, and there's not much activity, maybe a couple of bees coming out with cleaning flights, that's not a time to pull open your hives unless you have some kind of upper access that will not expose your bees to cold air and all you're doing is contributing to their feed resources. Pollen patties, pollen substitutes, dry sugar feed, emergency feeding, and things like that. We're just trying to get them through these rainy days. So don't open down into the brood chambers because you might even find a tight cluster there and you might think that they're dead. This is not the time to tear that apart. Thinking they're dead and knowing that they're dead are two completely different things and it happens all the time that people get excited and just feel like they just have to know if their bees are alive and they start pulling everything apart and they start looking at these little clusters of bees and they go, oh look, they're all dead. But then you start looking really closely at them and you, you can see that they're respirating and you can see that these, these bees start to move a little bit as they warm up. But guess what you've done to them? You have already shocked them with cold weather. So tiny clusters on their last leg you just put the final nail in their coffin by opening that in cold weather. If they are alive, they're going to let you know when the weather breaks and they can all move around. On the flip side, if they're dead, it doesn't hurt you. There's no reason to be pulling apart the frames in the middle of winter or while the weather's so bad. You can wait also until spring really arrives and then pull apart those colonies because you know what? Wax moths aren't flying around in the snow in the teens, in the low 30s, and uh, looking for places to lay their eggs. So you're, you're not heading off any kind of infestation. So wait and let your bees let you know if they're dead or alive when the weather really does break for real. Don't open them and get in there and make life already difficult. So I would not put water in the hive. 
stop feeding in the fall when it starts freezing and stop feeding in the spring or start feeding in the spring when it's necessary and you're also safe from freezing. So, and, and that's liquid syrup, by the way. So the solids can be fed anytime. You can feed solids in the dead of winter. So the next one is John McNeil. What are the health benefits of honey? That is a very common question. And I have to give you a disclaimer on that because I'm not a medical practitioner. I am not a nutritionist. I'm not qualified to talk to you in detail and in scientific terms about what the health benefits are of, in my case, raw honey. I've given lots of talks to Whole Foods co-ops groups and things like that, and I've had people raise their hand and say that uh, they've gotten off of medication by eating raw honey instead of taking um, seasonal allergy shots, for example. And so the, the evidence is pretty clear that people that buy raw regional honey and consume it will see a reduced impact on their allergies. So on the plants that are causing their allergies. Because regional honey has pollen particulates and things from those same plants and so you're actually building an immunity and uh, reducing the impact of it. Just remember that honey, if we look at the whole purpose of it, it's a sugar. So the fact that it's a natural sugar, I mean, I feel good about eating maple syrup because it comes from trees, honey comes from bees. So these sources of natural sugars can fool you into thinking, well, I can eat a whole bunch of that and I'm just not going to get overweight. It's still a sugar. It's a carbohydrate and it's going to load calories on, which is the purpose. Bees need it because they're consuming a lot of calories because they're burning a lot of those calories to stay warm and to survive. So it's a survival food. The bees did this terrific job of infusing honey with enzymes and antibacterial properties, which is why honey lasts forever. Uh, honey has been recovered in Egyptian pyramids, for example, that's still viable, they say. I'm sure it's solidified though. But uh, the thing of it is, those antibacterial properties of the honey, there's even, there's even hydrogen peroxide naturally occurring in the honey. So it's an antibacterial. So it gets used on wounds that are difficult to heal and things like that. There are holistic practitioners that take honey and use it to help heal wounds and restore soft tissue. So I'm going to, instead of try to explain all those details, I'm going to uh, give you a link in the video description that will connect you with a, a website that will describe in, in greater detail what all the health benefits of honey are, but it's more than just the benefits from eating the honey. Although even people that have um, ulcers and problems with digestion are often by holistic practitioners given honey as part of their remedy. So, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, you had a sore throat, my mom would cut chunk honey, which is honey still in the comb, and you would chew that if you had a bad cough or something, and that stuff really worked. So, there, it's broad in scope the health benefits of honey and specifically raw honey. Don't go to the store and buy a jar of Subi honey and put that on your wounds and stuff. I should probably not even name a product. But <laughs> the thing of it is a lot of store-bought honey, first of all, is not raw honey. It's been highly processed. It's been through lots of uh, treatment and alteration. And I have a link on my website, fredsfinefowl.com. It's called Raw Honey That Isn't, and it links you to a lot of the companies that are selling honey under raw labels, and it's been proven to be false honey. So, and, and again, that's not me saying it, I'm recycling research by other groups, okay? So I have not personally done the testing, but I can say that if you're trying to get honey in its rawest form, Get honey that has been through the least amount of processing, the least amount of filtering, the least amount of heating, and uh, you will get a greater benefit from those antibacterial properties, from the pollen that's in suspension that's gonna help you with allergies and things like that. The more raw the state, the better it's going to be for you. And of course, you will hear frequently not to give honey to babies a year of age or younger and uh, that's because it may actually have problems and cause the baby to have uh, diarrhea, for example, and put the baby's health at risk. 
So there are properties, antibacterial properties and other things in the honey that a not fully developed digestive system may have problems with. So a child over a year of age is pretty safe to give honey to. And uh, so that's it. And, and by the way, the least processed honey that you can get, and a lot of people don't want to hear this, but it comes from the flow hive. When you open up a frame from the flow hive, you have not touched the honey. It has not been through a filter. It has not been screened. It has not been heated. It has not been in an uncapper. It has not been in a spinner. It has not been through a bunch of tubes. Just the honey in the frame, the tube coming off of that, and going straight. This is flow hive honey. It goes straight into the jar, and that is all the processing that it goes through. No filtering, no screening. All the particulates are in here. I wanted to show one that had some this one has little particulates in suspension so the other thing is there's different types of honey even within that group so when you have the flow hive look at this stuff that's pretty cloudy but it's not solidified so you can get frame by frame different types of honey from a flow hive that doesn't happen in any other honey extraction process unless you're cutting out of a single frame, crushing the honey in that, you know, from that single frame and then processing that into a jar, which almost no one does. When it comes to processing honey, most traditional extractors are going to pull, you know, several boxes, several frames at once and they're going to process them all together and they're going to filter them all together and then they're going to bottle them all together so you do not get segregated honey types by flavor, floral source, and everything else. That only comes from the flow hive. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. If you want to know more about the flow hive, uh, tune in tomorrow for that. So the health benefits are widespread. Topical treatments, you know, uh, skin care products, there are honey balms. So the antibacterial properties of the honey and all the other healing parts of the you know the honey composition are widely known and celebrated and uh, as I said before I had a woman in one of my presentations stand up and say she was off meds she was terribly suffering from regional pollen output and getting um, you know puffy eyes sinus irritation and just a miserable life fixed by consuming raw honey the next thing someone's gonna say is well, how much raw honey should I take? Should I be taking two tablespoons a day, three teaspoons a day? Should I just be putting it in everything? I don't know the quantity. Again, I'm going to just refer you to people that have had success with it. Uh, and just follow the links in the video description for those who want to read more. I can't uh, make a personal recommendation because I have no allergies. Sorry, so I can't help with that. So that's it. And it's, uh, by the way, I found a really good article on that Healthline dot com h-e-a-l-t-h-l-i-n-e dot com so that was a good area that had a lot of information about raw honey next one from is from philip thomas and i'm going to uh, combine philip thomas with uh, thomas Komet, and that's because they had very similar questions uh, philip asked spring hive box rotation in other words do we rotate you know the brood boxes the bottom and the top do we swap them out and uh, Thomas Komet asked uh, would you touch on under super under supering is also called bottom supering sometimes and uh, all that is and I'm going to use my model beehive for this explanation so under supening under supering so in the winter time you would start off hopefully with this upper box being nothing but honey and that's the bees resources to get them through winter that's why they're storing honey in the first place the brood chambers are down here now surrounding the brood frame you also have the pollen that they need and you have the honey resources to support brood but as we hit winter that queen is going to stop laying eggs hopefully and uh, that leaves the cluster of bees that are surviving inside here they start to migrate up the center frames of uh, the honey and they're consuming that as they go and that's why when I take thermal pictures of beehives and I see that the the heat signature is right around here 
then I know that I have this much honey left in there before those bees are in jeopardy of starving out. And then uh, in the end, so this time of year, in the first week of March, they should all be up in this box. Now, under supering uh, has a lot of different meanings. So the first one, some people like to swap these boxes. So let's say now the brood is up here and we're about to go into a nectar flow. When you look at frames from these bottom boxes, and I'm going to address this more tomorrow, by the way, I'm going to show you how to get your bees to draw the comb out all the way to the bottom of the box. But in general, they don't run the brood comb all the way to the bottom. So you'll see, you know, a little horse shaped area that's open in the bottom there from the drawn comb and they don't finish it. That's because that's the closest to this hive entrance. So, but we know that up here, these frames will be drawn full length all the way to the bottom. And since the cluster is up here now and they've already started laying their eggs and developing brood for spring, then some beekeepers like to pull this box off, pull this box off, because now the queen and the brood and everything is here. And now we make that the bottom box going into spring. And then we take what was the bottom box and we put it up here and now they will finish drawing out because what the bees like to do is they like to create complete connective tissue that's why when you are pulling the frames out and you see a bunch of bird comb on the bottom of the frames and you've actually pulled apart all of that hard work that the bees did to join the top bars of the bottom box to the bottom of the bars on the top box and they they fill that whole space so when you pull it out you're cutting that away and making the bees do that again so by taking the bottom box and putting it up here, now they'll draw out these the rest of the way. So it is a good way to, and we know that they consumed the honey on this. So now the brood's down here. So the bee workers that are going out early in spring will of course fill this area first, all these frames, then they're gonna continue up here and start filling these. It's also the time when you want to find that really old comb in your boxes, get rid of it and swap it out for a new comb because they're gonna, start filling this super again. So under supering is just the same thing. So sometimes you have, uh, again, it's just swapping the brood box with a box that's above it. So if you have a honey super up here and you've got your bees in the brood box, and uh, again, they're not developing all the way down. And when you look at observation beehives and look at one of my observation bee videos, you'll see that I, you know, I was such a genius that I thought I would run eight frames, eight deeps inside my observation hive. And it took all my brood frames, so I have two full deeps at the bottom. Then I added two full frames of brood. And then I knew that, of course, they would build up the next two frames. So we have a four frame height here. And I thought they would naturally fill out the bottoms, but they didn't. So what they did was they filled out the frames they were on and then they started filling the frames going up with honey and resources. What they didn't do is they didn't go down. So now if I were under supering and I saw my bees, you know, if I had most of the, um, so if we took this out, this is what I'm talking about. If I can keep these from falling apart. This is my observation hive. We have four deeps high. All right, so I put my brood in here and I wanted them to expand up, which they did. Look, I have little cobwebs. Anyway, so they filled out these frames and they partially filled out this frame. So they held back from going all the way to the top and they held back from expanding. We had a little horseshoe here. If you uh, held a, a little chain and anchored it at two different points, you get that little arc there. That's kind of what the bees do. They're just hanging off of each other, which is also why you want to make sure that your beehive is perfectly level, not tilted to the left or to the right. Tilting forward and backwards is fine, but if it tilts to the left, you're going to get comb. Sometimes I look at bee yards and they have all these drunken beehives out there that are all tilted every which way. And I know there's some crazy honeycomb going on in there, but that's a different story. Okay, so then full brood, honey, and they're still building up here. But I want them to fill this out. So now I take this full brood frame doo, 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 and I under super. So I want to get this one out of here because it wasn't developed all the way. And let's say I put this up here and then I take this frame, which is full all the way. And I put this down here and then I leave this frame up here. Now 
I have the same brood frame here because I have four boxes. And now this one's full again. So now the bees are going to use what's already there. Where they wouldn't have drawn out the comb on their own because I gave them full drawn out comb now, they're going to start using this. And then now I saw this top one that's not good anymore. They didn't finish it. So now I'll take this. Let's say, let's say I take this. Up. Let's get this out of here. Let's make this a three box. Okay. The brood is here, full of honey, partially developed. Okay, full of honey, swap it, under supered. Now we have the brood frame here, full of honey, and the bees will migrate down and consume that honey, and now they've got full drawn out comb that starts to become honey, and the brood stays down here. They'll also finish this out. So all you're doing is forcing the bees to use the full frames and refreshing frames in the process. So if you've got the old crappy comb that you want to pull out, that's the time to do it. Let's do two boxes just to make sure that I've been clear on this. Okay. In wintertime, going into winter, this was all brood. This was all honey. So as winter progresses, the cluster comes up here, they're consuming the honey. And now we come into spring and this box has a bunch of holes in it and stuff. Now under super. Pull the bottom out, take the top, put the bottom on top. Now the bees, the cluster's here. The brood is here and again they move up again so it's just a matter of rotating boxes so i hope that and what's my philosophy on that do i do it i should do it the problem is it only works when the boxes all match so if you have deep supers which is what these are and they're both deeps those are interchangeable if you take a shallow super and put it on the bottom and under super with that and then you get a bunch of brood in the shallow super i personally don't like that so I do not do a lot of that. That's my illustration. Under supering, taking a top box and putting it underneath the brood chamber or making it the bottom box. I'm sure there's lots of people that do it. Lots of people like to rotate that. And as I said before, it's a good time and a good way to start to pull out old frames and replace them with new ones. And what I do is I take wooden frames and put them right next to my acorn plastic frames. So I'll have a plastic frame, wooden frame, plastic frame, wooden frame. And the empty wooden frames with little starter strips, I'm going to go over that again tomorrow too. Those, uh, those then get drawn out with fresh comb. And I use nothing but wooden frames with non-foundation. The only place I put those is in the brood boxes. So there's that. I hope that helped. Okay, box rotation right there. So I answered two people. And what else did Thomas ask? Uh, do, 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 do. That's it. So I got those two out of the way. Mohammed now asks, can't we just put a queen excluder on the brood box entrance to prevent swarming? You know, that seems like a good idea, but it actually is not a good idea. And I'll explain why. If you have a hive of bees and you want to prevent swarming and as your method for keeping them from swarming, you put a queen excluder. Normally, where's the queen excluder going to be? This is the brood box. This is where the queen is. This is where all the baby bees are being developed. Eggs are laid, pupa, everything else. Then we have a queen excluder between these two boxes because we want honey that is nothing but honey. So the question here by Muhammad is, what if we just had a grid on the front of the landing board here and no upper entrance and no other egress route for the bees and we just put that there, then all the workers could come and go. And would that prevent swarming? It might prevent swarming, but it also prevents drones from getting in and out of the world. So if your drones are trapped, your genetics are trapped, and I personally, don't want to prevent swarming. So again, if you're asking me questions, I'm going to share, you know, my thoughts on it and how I do that myself. So I personally don't want to stop my hives from swarming because I like the local genetics. I want them to interbreed with uh, feral colonies that are in the area. I want my queens to go out. I like to get new queens. If that fails, I requeen on my own. So, and by the way, that's not new when there are 
um, entomologists doing research with bee genetics, they often don't want their drones to get out and they don't want their queens to get out and interact with other bees. So they do have systems around their hives that prevent the queens and the drones from getting out because those are experiments that they're trying to control and they want absolute control over the genetics. So can it be done? It can. Should it be done? Remember, uh, my frequently asked question series is set up for backyard beekeepers, people that just have a handful of hives, maybe just want one or two, and everything you're doing is on a smaller scale. So you have to ask yourself, why do you want to stop them from swarming? They will replenish themselves. We're not commercial beekeepers, so we're not worried about the bottom line. Uh, I personally do not want to stop them, but can you think of a time when there were research bees that they were doing genetic studies on where they put queen excluders on the entire hive to prevent those genetics from getting out and they actually did get out later by mistake and that's when we're talking about the africanized bees that came to this country in the 50s uh, there was a doctor that was uh, doing his research on the bees and he went to africa and he brought in african honeybees and he wanted to do genetic research with those bees and let me see he did that research down in Brazil, and he did these tests starting in 1957. So what happened was down in Brazil, he realized that those bees might do very well in the hot climates of Brazil because the European honeybee lines, those that were being kept by beekeepers, were not doing very well in that climate. So he had this cool idea, let's bring a bunch of them over, and then let's make sure that they can't mix up with colonies in that country already so they put queen excluders on the whole hive and what happened he goes on vacation he has visiting uh, researchers that are also checking out his apiary and trying to learn because he did a lot of genetics he studied stingless bees and everything else in fact i think he got his phd on stingless honeybees so he was experimenting with the genetics but guess what one of the visiting scientists nobody owned up to it <clears throat> Well, so I looked at those hives and said, wow, look, these queen, these queen excluder things, all the bees can't get in and out of them. I'll bet I could improve production if I just took these off. So they did. They went around while the head of the research program was out of the country, and they pulled off all those queen excluders and 26 queen African bees, which now were called killer bees, and now they're Africanized bees. Those genetics got out because somebody pulled off the queen excluder and the drones and the queens got out and genetically uh, infiltrated the local colonies of bees. And the thing is too, those Africanized bees were so aggressive and so fast at taking over other colonies and they swarm so often that they propagated quickly. The thing is, they're good for the tropics. Uh, they uh, cannot handle the cold weather climates and stuff. That's why I don't live in the south because I'm afraid of them, just kidding. But uh, they have to go through several uh, genetic adaptations before they're going to be able to move north. And uh, they have calmed down a lot, but we still have Africanized bees and talk to people in Texas or Florida just to find out how uh, hyper-defensive those are. So I know I kind of went off the rails. By the way, that Dr. Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, uh, he passed away last year. That's the guy that brought the uh, African honeybees to Brazil. So, and he was actually a, a fantastic research scientist, and unfortunately he got overshadowed by all the buzz about the uh, Africanized bees and the people that have died. 16 people a year, roughly, over a thousand people since they've been released have been killed by those uh, Africanized honeybees. So it started off as a good thing, but uh, because they couldn't contain it, I don't personally want to contain my bees because I don't have Africanized bees. I like them to swarm, and uh, I like to see what happens. Sure, you're losing a bunch of your bees. We're not in the bee business. I'm not in the honey business. I'm in the in the knowledge business. So what I do is I like to see those swarms and I like to see the behavior and I like to see the preparations and I like to see the supersedure cells, which are new queens being developed so that they can take over the hive. And uh, that's why I that's why I keep bees to learn about them. So I don't have those pressures. How much honey am I going to get this year? How much pollen can I sell? You know, can I sell queens? Can I can I rear queens? Can I expand my colony? To me, a perfect apiary is 10 and no more. So again, my product is knowledge and videos and photos of bees.
So I don't see anything wrong with them swarming. It's what they do naturally. That is a superorganism giving birth to another superorganism. And it's fascinating. So, Mohammed, I hope I answered that. I don't want to prevent swarming by that. Now, you can prevent swarming other ways. I wouldn't lock them in, but you can expand the boxes. You can give them more resources and you can do everything you can to encourage them to stay. Because when their numbers are at their peak and the resources are high and the colony's healthy, uh, that's when they're apt to swarm. In fact, when spring comes where I live, I know people are going to be talking about swarms right away because colonies that come through winter really strong are going to swarm out early in the spring. So one of the ways of preventing that, this is, and this is better than putting a queen excluder on the front of your whole hive. When you see that build up and you open that brood box and they're wall to wall bees and you've still got that medium super on and you find that that's being filled up and there's pollen and there's nectar and everything's coming in and the numbers are high, do a split. Keep your queen, set up another box and split the brood. And then you'll cut down on the numbers of bees hatching out. You'll slow things down. And also some of this uh, under supering stuff that you can do when you take a top box and put it underneath, for some reason that can slow down their tendency to swarm as well. So it seems like when you alter their environment, either through expansion or by shifting box order and things like that, you can confuse them and destabilize them enough that hopefully they won't swarm. You can also take advantage of that rapid explosive buildup of bee population by making splits and pulling frames of brood and hopefully leaving the parent queen in there. But you can also take the frame that's got the queen on it, along with some other brood frames, and put her and them in that new box. Most of those nurse bees have never left that colony in the first place. They don't know where they are. You gave that queen a new environment to live in. And now if you've got open cells, that means that you've got eggs and pupa or eggs and larvae, sorry, pupa's already covered and there's nothing else you can do with them. But if you have eggs and larvae in there and they have lots of royal jelly around them, you can leave them here and take a gamble that they will create a queen cell in the absence of the queen and they will create a new colony all on their own. So by creating splits, whether you leave the queen here or transfer her to another box, you're going to cut down on their propensity to swarm because you've cut their numbers down and you've altered the environment with different frames. So changing the environment through expansion, rotation, order, things like that, or splitting, you can offset their instinct to swarm. Now that I've told you all of that, what's going to happen is you're going to follow my advice to a T and your bees are going to swarm. Because bees do whatever they do and uh, you can kind of get a method that seems to work, but one thing I know for sure about bees is nothing is for sure when it comes to the bees, but you'll have multiple colonies if that's what you want but I personally would not recommend putting a, a queen excluder over the whole hive. And Gardum, I hope I said that right, G-A-R-D-U-M, posted a question. Do you have to collect the honey from a beehive? So that's an interesting question because there are a lot of people that just want to put a beehive in their garden and they just want to have hands off. They just want to put their bees out there and just let them be bees and do what they want to do. So you do not have to take the honey off, but there is some caution that comes with that. So if you're not taking the honey off and, and you have a set size hive, in fact, if you buy a hive kit from Better Bee or Daydont or something like that, you're going to get two deep boxes and then you're going to get two medium supers and then you're going to get the inner cover, the cover, the landing board, and that's your whole kit. So eventually your bees are going to, if they're healthy, they're going to fill that whole space, both deep supers or both deep boxes, and then you're going to have two full supers of honey. Then what do the bees do once that's done? So if you're not taking the honey off, uh, you have two choices. You're either going to have to expand the bees, resources. You're going to have to start making one of those super colonies that has, you can see beehives that have seven or eight boxes stacked on them, primarily in the south, not up north so much, but it does happen when you're not taking off any honey and you just have to keep adding space for them to store. But what happens is you create a huge area by allowing that accumulation of honey uh, for the bees to police. Remember, we want the bees, I keep hygienic survivor bees that are untreated. 
uh, they're great at policing it. And again, we'll go back to the observation hive. I see gangs of them just combing every edge of it. They're just on patrol all the time. I took a red pen light and shined it in there and they go right after it. Now people say they can't see red, that bees don't see red. Well, they may not see it as red, but whatever color they do see, they react to it because I can take that pen light and any place I want the bees to go, I shine that pen light inside that colony on that wall and it's a red spectrum light and uh, all the bees congregate there. I put a red light up against one of the vent holes on it and they plugged it up. There were so many bees piling onto that spot. So they react to it, whether they see red, I don't know, but they definitely know there's a light there and they go after it. So you're going to have to give an area for them that they can actively police, that they can protect it from Varroa. The Varroa resistant hygienic bees and stuff, the more area you give them to cover, the more active they have to be to defend it. So if you just let them build honey and honey and honey and honey and honey and it expands, uh, eventually you're going to have a problem with uh, pest infestation. You might have a problem with small hive beetles. I have never had a problem with small hive beetles. I've never had to treat for them. Uh, my bees just run them out on their own. There are so many bees. Now the other thing is, of course, I'm in the frozen, you know, snow belt here. But uh, strong colonies that can actively patrol the entire interior of their space are not going to be uh, infected or taken over by small hive beetles and things like that. Wax moths, same thing. They're going to move in in areas that are not defended. So if you never ever take honey off, I would say let somebody else take the honey. Eventually, bees... I've seen the side of a house. I used to be a home inspector in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I've seen the side of a house. Uh, all the sheathing in the house was pulled off because there were bees inside that house wall, the outside wall. When they pulled it off, studs are 16 inches on center. So we had a 16 inch width colony of bee comb, right? And then we had the, uh, uh, they're two by fours. So you know, three and a half inches front to back. And then it went up the full height of the wall. So that's eight feet and extended into the soffit area. And they were in the process of spreading out width wise. So it was over a thousand pounds of honey in there. So the thing is, once they were taking over, they were chewing away the insulation and expanding out to en encompass now a 32 inch zone. Uh, they can't be policing that on their own. But what it demonstrated to me was that uh, bees will continue to expand the comb and continue to store honey well beyond what they can use. I mean, that's how we end up keeping bees as an agricultural practice in the first place is they have this tendency to build this enormous surplus that they personally don't use. So left on their own, bees are going to fill every nook and cranny with honey. And then you think, well, don't they just use that later? Won't the colony get so big that they take it over? No, because a colony has a maximum density. They have a maximum number of bees that they can grow to. Even if you had a queen that laid the perfect, you know, 1700 eggs a day, and throughout that uh, brood season, she was hatching 1,700 eggs, 1,700 pupae were coming out of there every day. You're going to lose a bunch of those bees just in general when they're flying out. Uh, they only live so many weeks. So you do end up with a maximum number of bees. So you won't end up with, you know, a million bee hive. So unless you're, no, you just the life expectancy of the bee, the number of eggs a queen can lay, limit that. But for you to have a hive that would accommodate that would be this enormous beehive, assuming again that they're healthy because during their productive lives, those foraging bees will just continue to expand comb, continue to fill it with honey, expand the comb, fill it with honey, expand the comb, fill it with honey. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the colony increases in number. So they still only consume so much. And then what the bees do is they don't go all the way to the top of that and consume the honey way up there. They consume the honey around them and as they migrate in a group and they consume the honey that they're on, 
that's enough to get them through winter. And then what happens in spring? Oh, they move back down and they go back to that comb and then they start refilling what they consume during the winter. So all the surplus they built up in the higher parts of it never got consumed. So some of that really old in the spring, like when we hit uh, May and June, I'll pull off boxes of honey left over from last year. So when we pull off the old honey and replace the frames, now I have all this old honey that I have to deal with. But that's when you can use, you can use that for chunk honey, you can put it in jars, you can pour honey over it. Uh, you still get that even when you have a flow hive because I have a deep box and I have a medium box or another deep and that's got honey in it. And then I have the flow hive. So I do end up still with full frames of honey that I can either extract traditionally or I can cut it away and use it for chunk honey because that stuff is great. And if you don't take it off every year, it's just not fresh because the bees are walking all over it and everything else. So can you? Yes. Should you? I would say no. Uh, just because unless you want to leave a box that's that size, then what's going to happen is they'll fill the space, swarm out. And then they'll fill the space again and swarm out. So uh, that's the other thing that would happen is you'd have a, a swarm machine. So I mean, I've done that myself when I need bees, when I want swarms. I leave the hive, you know, to two deeps and a medium super, and then I just let them build up. And when I see it's chock-a-block full and I see all the bees congregating on the outside and I see the waggle dancing and the bees hovering, waiting for the queen, I know I'm about to get a swarm and I use that. So if you want swarms because you want to study swarms, I push them to swarm and allow it. Uh, but if you're just trying to keep bees, you're just going to have a swarm machine. You're still going to want to look at them and inspect them and understand what's going on in the colony and you're going to be responsible for the health of the bees. So I have to close that out by saying if all you want to do is set up a hive of bees and you want to put your packaged bees in there or your nukes or however you're going to start and then you just want to be hands off and not do anything with those bees, my suggestion is don't keep bees. And that's because you really do have a responsibility when you keep a beehive to look in on them and make sure that that's a healthy colony of bees because here's the worst end of it. If those bees end up with American fowl brood or European fowl brood, or if they get some illness that puts other colonies in jeopardy that belong to other people, you have become the source of that disease. I'm not saying it would happen. I'm saying that there is the possibility. So unless you're willing to put on a bee suit and get into those bees and look at frames and understand the potential health hazards that can occur in a bee colony, uh, I would not recommend keeping the bees. So there really is no buy a box, put bees in it, set it somewhere, leave it, and then never touch it again just because you want to contribute to the pollinators. If you really want to contribute to pollinators in your area and pollination, on the flip side of that, what you can do that's completely hands-off is you can plant trees for the pollinators and, of course, flowers that uh, feed them. Let your yard turn over to clover in spring. Let your yard turn over to dandelions early on. You know, have, uh, have things that the bees can use and enjoy the pollinators without uh, becoming responsible for a hive. Because when you do set up a beehive, you do have to become accountable for uh, the health and well-being of those bees. Now there's a video on YouTube that has a hive. I think they said it's untouched for 10 years or something. So those are hives left on their own. And uh, how do bees even survive that? So there's a lot of speculation. Wow, those must be, I think I wrote a comment on there. Those are some of the best genetics you could ever get a hold of because they've obviously survived uh, every imaginable pest and uh, they've survived in unattended hives that they're even coming apart. They're physically decomposing. So those bees survived on their own, but how did they handle that? Uh, most bees, when they're faced with any kind of disease, their method for coping with that is to uh, completely abandon the hive. So what could have happened, let's do this. Why aren't there diseases and why aren't there varroa and uh, everything else that would have attacked that colony of bees? This is my speculation, that if you had a hive that was completely unattended like that and there's bees in it and they're surviving 10 years untouched, since they weren't monitored for 10 years, 
you don't know that that colony was continuously occupied by bees. So just bear with me. Sometimes people will say, uh, anyone who keeps bees and doesn't treat for Varroa or whatever becomes a Varroa farmer and then they're sending Varroa out to all the other beekeepers. Or they leave the colony, the colony dies, and now it's a Varroa bomb. No, it isn't. Because in the winter time, when that colony died from Varroa, let's say, the Varroa need a host. They're parasitic. They need a host to survive. They need to attach themselves to a living bee so they can feed off the fat stores of that bee's abdomen. Now, when that colony dies, the Varroa can't feed on them. So you can't say from a dead colony in spring uh, that those Varroa now are getting all over everybody else's colonies. No, they aren't because the Varroa have long since died because the host for the parasite also died. They didn't have the warmth they needed. They're a parasite. They depend on the bee to live. So you don't have a Varroa bomb unless the bees live with the Varroa and stay alive long enough to keep the Varroa alive into the following spring. Then they get robbed by other bees and then they have the opportunity for their Varroa to jump ship from a sick bee to a healthy bee and then take that back to another hive. But if the colony dies out, the Varroa died out too. So you don't, that's where the wax moths take over everything because they need wax. They don't, they're not parasitic to the bees. They eat your wax. So my theory about the, you know, the 10 year hives and colonies that survive without intervention, without people being around at all, is that I think they may have even died out completely several times and been reoccupied by scout bees and swarms may have moved into them. Unless you know for sure and have seen it occupied full time year after year, that's a different thing. But if they, you know, if, you know, nine years ago, somebody used to take care of bees in this yard and the person passed away or whatever happened and they got abandoned, then we come 10 years later and say, whoa, there's still bees in it. You don't know how many times they uh, swarmed out and uh, left it abandoned for a season or died out through a winter and the new bees moved in and cleaned house. Uh, because again, when that happens, the parasitic activity stops because the parasitic host is dead. And ants can even clean out the dead bodies of uh, a beehive, for example. So there are a lot of things that can happen that we don't know about. Uh, don't even know why I started talking about that, but uh, yeah, you have a responsibility to look at it. Uh, it's a big question mark whether or not unattended hives really do survive for decades. Because uh, we, again, through observation, don't know. There's bee trees, for example, that have had feral colonies. That's a study ongoing in my state right now. They're taking samplings from these bee trees and these resident feral colonies to see what their health is and what kind of uh, issues they have. And I think a lot of them survive by swarming out and uh, abandoning the bad situation until that bad situation is mitigated and then another colony may move in and clean up again. So it's another area for great discussion and uh, for learning about bees. So thank you to those of you who sent your questions in that posted them. Please feel free to post again under this video down in the comment section. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I didn't get out the, the flow hive setups for northern climates. I'm making some uh, unique pieces of gear that are going to go with that. And I wanted that to be perfect before I put that out. And I was not interested in working in an 11 and 12 degree wood shop while I tried to do that. So that will come out this weekend and I will talk about uh, preparing hives for winter. So thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Put your questions down below and we'll do another FAQ hopefully next Friday. So thanks again and have a great weekend.